So good morning. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here as part of this conference. And I'm very pleased to be able to present um, Lenia Fernandez, Johannes Vassalos, and my joint research. Um, in this talk, we'll be discussing the early use, use of microscopes in 1839 to better understand the microsurface of the garotype plates. And our research started with a detailed study of this pamphlet called Phototyp nach der Erfindung des Professor Beres in Wien, published in 1840 by Dr. Josef Beres, a professor of histological anatomy at the University of Vienna. The pamphlet is held by the Reichsmuseum Research Library, and it's one of only three known copies today. It holds four intaglio prints made directly from etched daguerreotype plates, one of which you can see here, and this is an image of the roofs of Vienna with the Stephansdom in the background. We published an extensive article on Beres's work and on our attempts at recreating his process in the Reichsmuseum Bulletin in 2018. However, we remain curious about the reasoning behind Beres's process. We know that he immersed his daguerreotype plates in nitric acid in order to etch the shadows, but how did he know this would work? How could he reason that the highlights would be protected from the acid? We theorized that it was mainly the examination of daguerreotypes with high magnification under a microscope that was key to enabling researchers to grasp how the process actually worked. Coupling the results of microscopic examination with scientific experiments and a good knowledge of chemistry and physics then led to the first ideas of image formation in the daguerreotype process. Before Josef Beres in France, another doctor, Alfred Donnet, had already experimented with etching and printing daguerreotypes. And these are the only two prints that I've seen so far that were made from an etched daguerreotype plate by Donnet. Even before Dr. Beres, Donnet must have had a fundamental understanding of the structural components of the daguerreotype. And a few years later, in the eight, early 1840s, Hippolyte Fizeau became very successful at etching and printing daguerreotypes. We can see one of his etched plates here showing Paris rooftops as viewed from his uh, window. But let us go back in time to early 1839. Daguerre had been perfecting his process for some years by then, and he must have had a good selection of plates in his atelier. This view of Notre Dame may have been one of them. After the first public announcement in January 1839, Daguerre received a stream of curious visitors, and he must have had a magnifying glass at hand, since a number of reports indicate that his visitors, who were seeing a daguerreotype for the first time, also looked at his plates with magnification. For example, Samuel Morse wrote on March 7, 1839, the exquisite minuteness of the delineation cannot be conceived. No painting or engraving ever approached it. By the assistance of a powerful lens, which magnified 50 times, applied to the delineation, every letter of a distant sign was clearly and distinctly legible, and also were the minutest breaks and lines in the walls of the buildings. The effect of the lens upon the picture was in a great degree like that of the telescope in nature. It's easy to try out this telescope yourself. Hold a magnifying glass above any daguerreotype. Here we're, we are looking at one that I made last year of the Reichsmuseum. And even the smallest of plates, minus just eight by 11 centimeters in size, will reveal a whole world of detail otherwise hidden to the human eye. You can count every small window pane, but more than that, you can even see tonal varieties in each individual brick in this large building. At this spot on this small daguerreotype, the magnifying glass clearly makes out a stone figure hunched on a structural support in the roof of the side wing of the building. Let's take the same magnifying glass and apply it to an engraving twice the size of the daguerreotype. To the naked eye, the image is made up of fine lines. But magnification disappoints here. The image is still made up of lines, nothing more than that. Similarly, this lithograph put under the same loop reveals a rough grain that only without magnification forms an image that we can understand. So there's no new insight by magnification here. It even gives you less information. But etchings, drawings, and paintings were made for looking at with the naked eye, of course, at a normal viewing distance. So our loop experiment has shown that the image-forming entities of a daguerreotype must be infinitely smaller than those of engravings and lithographs. During his presentation of the daguerreotype on August 19th, François Arago relates the results of examinations conducted by Jean-Baptiste Dumas, who determined the image-forming particles to be small, regular, sphérules d'amalgame that are very concentrated in the highlights, gradually decreasing in number in the half-tints, and completely disappearing in the shadows. 
and that have an average diameter of one eight hundredth of a millimeter. Um, this amounts to an, a diameter of about 1.25 micrometers in today's terms. And 150 years later, daguerreotype researcher Susan Barger measured particles to have a diameter of 0 0.1 to 2 micrometers. So Dumas turns out to absolutely to be absolutely correct with his calculations. This then is a key realization at the very onset of daguerreotypy. Only these minute particles allow photography to depict fine variations in tone. And the particles have to be smaller than the subject they are depicting for this effect to realize. Alfred Donnet had also been busy examining daguerreotypes with a high magnification of a microscope. One month after the first demonstration of the daguerreotype in Paris, he wrote to the Academy, I would be grateful if you would be kind enough to make public the following results of the microscopic observations that I have made on the operations of the daguerreotype, which I believe may contribute to establishing the theory of this beautiful and ingeniously discovery. Similar to Dumas, Donnet is also trying to describe what he sees under the microscope, and he finds the descriptive term petite goudelette, or small droplets. In a translation of Donnet's findings, the British journal The Chemist uses another descriptive term that pretty much nails his observation. They write, the microscope shows a crowd of mercurial globules. So they're describing not just individual droplets here and there, but large groupings of them. Paul Gauthier Besser agrees that the particles are round and perhaps bumpy. He uses the term mamelonné or mamillary in English, a term that means having several smoothly rounded convex surfaces, and which is typically used by geologists to describe the form of malachite mineral clusters, such as you can see here. And it's fascinating to read how early researchers are searching for the right words to describe what they are seeing, and they're falling back onto the descriptive terminology of other disciplines. But the nature of the Daguerrean image is not that easy to fathom. And even 10 years later, in 1849, one is still musing about its structure. Antoine Claudet has his own theory. He writes, this mercury vapor is condensed in the form of a white powder, having also, when examined by the microscope, the appearance of reflecting crystals. Of course, scientists of the time were trying to understand how these particles are formed. And of all of the stages of the making of the daguerreotype were subject to microscopic examination. At this point in our research, we felt that we needed to better understand what exactly scientists were seeing when they were using microscopes in the late 1830s and early 1840s. It is one thing to read about their experience, but can we really understand their amazement at discovering crowds of minute spherules on a silver plate? We know that William Henry Fox Talbot owned at least one microscope by the French optician Charles Chevalier. And we can see it here in one of his calotype negatives from 1842. No good positive print exists of this negative. So here's a digitally enhanced positive detail showing the microscope. We can probably assume that the French pioneers, such as Donnet and Dumas, were also using mainly French microscopes. It would have been a matter of honor after all. We know that Joseph Beres in Vienna was familiar with microscopes made by the Austrian optical instrument maker, Simon Plössl. In fact, Plessel was very interested in photography and worked closely with Beres. The better devices of this period are all compound microscopes with a simple brass frame, such as we can see here. And we can see the similarities between the French model and this Austrian device. In the Netherlands, we were able to locate microscopes made by Simon Plessel and roughly dating to the period in which photography was invented. Shown here is Plessel's compound microscope at the Tylers Museum in Haarlem. Produced around 1830, with a historical daguerreotype laid on a separate stage under the lens. We fixed the camera on a modern microscope stand above the ocular of the historic microscope. And after much experimentation, we found that a simple smartphone gave us the best results. The plate was brightly illuminated with a modern fiber optic LED lamp. Even so, I found it quite difficult to look through the ocular. Firstly, the diameter of the ocular is much smaller than we are used to looking through today. So it was quite hard to find the right angle with my eye. Secondly, the glass elements of the device have suffered over time, resulting in a somewhat dull image. The second Plessel microscope we were able to use was one from around 1850 at the Universitätsmuseum in Utrecht. And we are grateful, of course, to both institutions for actually allowing us to use these historical devices. This is the daguerreotype that we examined, and it's from my private collection. Starting with the second microscope, the one in Utrecht, here are our results. 
magnified at approximately 215 times. This is a detail of the gentleman's eye. The overall quality of the image is very good. It is not sharp from edge to edge, but that is even difficult to achieve with a modern day microscope. The individual image particles can clearly be seen, and it is indeed apparent that they occur at a higher frequency, that there are crowds, in the image highlights than in the shadows. Furthermore, we can see that some particles appear to be larger than others. Or are these just clusters of smaller particles? And at this magnification, this can be a little difficult to determine. For comparison, here's a photomicrograph of that same spot taken with a modern device. While the overall contrast is higher and the image is cleaner, the modern image is not necessarily very much sharper, nor does it seem to render more detail. We did not conduct any resolution measurements or mathematically examine the optical aberrations of the two devices. The whole exercise was really to get a personal sense of what could be seen in 1839. The lens combination that we could use on the microscope in Harlem, the second microscope, gave us a higher magnification, which was approximately 310 times. This transition from highlight to shadow, this spot, is a very fine uh, place to examine the daguerreotype particles. One can only imagine the excitement of Donnet, Dumas, and Beres when they laid a plate under their microscopes and discovered this minute world populated by an almost infinite number of tiny particles seemingly arranging themselves in such a design that as the viewing distance of the eye increased, an image began to form that would, at a certain moment, turn into a recognizable feature, an eye or a head a person. But excitement aside from what we know, these men were first and foremost scientists, and they were presumably primarily interested in the chemistry and physics of the Daguerrean image, its surface characteristics, essentially its micro topography. And following from that point of departure, how one could put these distinctive features to further use. Here again, comparison with a modern photomicrograph doesn't give us much more information that we already had with the historic view. I do think though at this magnification, we can already start to see particles with different diameters. We do know that it would have been possible for practitioners at the time to examine their plates at higher magnification. However, due to the technical difficulties we had with the historic lenses, we uh, had to be satisfied with 310 times. One other related question has been keeping me busy. We know that photomicrographs were being made with daguerreotypes, so using a photographic process as a tool of inquiry. A good example is Andreas von Ettingshausen's plant cross-section, as seen here. And Alfred Donnet and Léon Foucault also made a series of photomicrographs of blood cells and other bodily liquids and salts in the mid-1840s. And even Daguerre himself is reported to have used a solar microscope to photograph the head of a spider. Unfortunately, this plate does not exist anymore, so we can only imagine what it must have looked like. And we have already seen that daguerreotypes were not just tools of scientific inquiry, but that they're also the subject of scientific inquiry. The plates themselves were being examined with microscopes. But I've yet to find a report of a historic photomicrograph of a daguerreotype, so I felt I needed to rectify this deficiency. So here again is the daguerreotype of the Rijksmuseum that we saw earlier in this talk. And this is possibly the first daguerreotype photomicrograph of a daguerreotype. We might call it a daguerreomicrograph. An enlargement of the gargoyle-like figure on the roof taken with a modern microscope. And it clearly shows the image forming particles of the original plate. If we continue to magnify this daguerreomicrograph, of course, we'll find at some point that each one of these reproduced image particles is in itself actually made up of clusters of minute particles and so on and so on. And at some point, even a daguerreotype with all of its detail and sharpness will start to fall apart into micrometer sized dots. So let us finish this tale with Alfred Donnet's scientific inquiries. Our original question had been, how did he and Josef Beres in Vienna understand that nitric acid would only bite into the shadow areas of the daguerreotype plate and not the highlights. In 1840, Donnet sums up his reasoning in one marvelous and long sentence that demonstrates his scientific thinking. After having ascertained, says Monsieur Donnet, and I've summarized this a little bit, first, that the yellow layer was really formed of iodide of silver, so that's the sensitizing of the plate. Second, that light, or rather the chemical rays accompanying it, acted on this layer, that's the exposure part. Third, that the mercurial vapor caused the appearance of the image. So that's our development state. Fourth, 
that the layer of iodine was dissolved and removed by a solution of hyposulfate of soda and by washing in water. So this is processing, fixing, and washing. Fifth, that the photographic image resulted from a more or less condensed amalgam of mercury and silver, forming light parts and demitints, and bare surfaces producing shades, like pieces of ice, which reflect black. So this part is the image formation, which he's by then understood. Now he comes to his conclusion. I thought it might be possible to find some chemical agent able to attack the bare parts of the silver, sparing the light parts formed by the amalgam of that metal with mercury. So Donet's reasoning is quite clear here and is really the tool of microscopic examination that allows him to come to this conclusion. And I'll give you one more quote before we end. Thousands and thousands of drawings will be made with the daguerreotype, ere its mode of action be completely analyzed. And this is Francois Arago, um, quite shrewdly at the announcement for the daguerreotype on the 19th of August in 1839. And even today, 180 years later, new methods of analysis are giving us new insights into how the daguerreotype works. And there are many, many questions still to be answered. So this brief talk has focused only on the use of microscopes to determine how to go about etching daguerreotype plates. Future research, I hope, will examine the broader question of how magnification helped early researchers develop their image formation theories. And especially I'm interested in the form, the actual physical form of the particles, which in 1839 and 1840 were described as round, but today we know they can have lots of different types of forms. So with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge those who helped us put together this talk and do this research, specifically the curators at the Tylers Museum and Universiteitsmuseum, Klinike van de Speck and Paul Lambers, and uh, Jan Willem Pette, whom you see here, who is the objects conservator at both of those museums, working with one of those microscopes with me. And I'd also like to thank the Rijksmuseum, the Netherlands Photo Museum, and the National Archives UK for giving us the time to do this research. Thank you very much.